The woman plantation owner was a powerful figure who ruled over the slaves with an iron fist. She was not only the owner, but also supervised the work of all the slaves on the plantation. Her authority was unmatched and she used it to exploit the slaves for her own gain. It was inevitable that the private parts of the slaves would be exploited, and they would be used to fulfill the lustful fantasies of the plantation owners. The female slaves on the plantation were not spared from the brutal treatment meted out to the males. They were flogged for minor offenses and left standing in the field for long periods in the bright sun. The life of the slaves was below any level of humanity, and the plantation owner's licentious behavior was a testimony to the inhumane treatment meted out to the slaves. Harriet Jacobs, a former slave, wrote about her experiences on the plantation in her book, Incident in the Life of a Slave Girl. She described the harsh and unforgiving nature of the plantation owners and the fear that hung over the slaves like a cloud. The slaves were taught to fear their masters and to avoid any form of rebellion or disobedience. The plantation owner's obsession with her own desires led her to exploit the slaves in the most cruel and inhumane way possible. The slaves were forced to submit to their cruel fate, knowing that any form of resistance would only lead to further punishment. The life of the slaves on the plantation was a living nightmare, a stark reminder of the injustice and inequality that existed in the antebellum South. It was a life that was below any level of humanity and one that would leave a permanent scar on the souls of the slaves and their descendants. Dissatisfied Wives Discontented wives of plantation owners often found solace in the arms of their slaves. However, this was not an easy feat, as the women were expected to be obedient and cheerful while their husbands were away. As a result, many of them turned to the domestic servants for comfort, exploiting them in ways that were both degrading and empowering. These women were trapped in a world where their only form of escape was through their sexuality. They resorted to affairs with their slaves, knowing that it was a sin that would not be forgiven. However, this gave them a sense of euphoria that they could not find elsewhere. Despite the risks of having children with slaves, many of the plantation owners' wives took the chance. They saw their slaves as property, and the thought of their children being born into slavery was not an option. The relationships between the mistresses and slaves were often less intimate than those between the husbands and slaves but they still existed and were often kept secret. As the wives grew older, they became even more isolated and lonely. Their husbands were never there to comfort them, and the slaves they had once turned to for solace were now just a distant memory. They were trapped in a world where their only purpose was to be a wife and mother, and they longed for something more. In the end, these women were left with a sense of disappointment and disgust. They had been duped into thinking that their lives would be filled with happiness and joy, but instead, they were surrounded by sadness and loneliness. Despite their privileged upbringing, they were still slaves to their own desires and were unable to find true happiness. In the personal accounts of dark-skinned slaves, we discover a troubling narrative, the widespread exploitation of their intimate lives. Mistresses, driven by various motivations, often resorted to this form of exploitation. Some did so out of sheer boredom, while others were fueled by intense frustration in their romantic pursuits. What they couldn't attain elsewhere, they sought in their power over slaves, finding in it a compensation for their personal failures in other aspects of life. Restingly, intimate relationships also transcended racial boundaries, with white mistresses engaging in connections with dark-skinned male slaves. This reveals the intricate interplay of multiple, sometimes contradictory sources of oppression and power. By delving into this intersectional analysis, we gain a deeper understanding of how individuals occupying a low status in one social sphere can simultaneously wield a high status in another. It's important to note that mistresses often wielded the authority to coerce black slaves into these relationships, a point Captain Richard Hinton also emphasized. He shared stories of confident-looking colored men who had been compelled, either by their mistresses or white women of similar social status, into such connections. Advances weren't directed towards her equals or even her father's more intelligent servants. Instead, she chose the most brutalized, over whom she could exercise her authority with less fear of exposure. 
housewives held a crucial role in preserving traditional Christian values and maintaining peace and stability within the household. They were highly esteemed for their ability to fulfill these vital duties, making them indispensable members of the community. Unveiling the secret lives of mistresses. Beneath the veneer of societal norms and prevailing culture, the intimate lives of mistresses held a complex and captivating story. Adultery, in this era, exacted a higher toll on women, casting a more unforgiving shadow upon them than it did on unfaithful men. Furthermore, housewives faced severe reproach for bearing children out of wedlock, a burden that weighed heavily on white women, setting them apart from their dark-skinned counterparts. White women, especially those hailing from the upper echelons of society, were celebrated for their moral conduct, extending even into the realms of intimacy. They were expected to epitomize modesty and restraint. Yet, the reality within the plantations painted a vastly different tableau. The image of virtue and chastity, so exalted in public, clashed starkly with the truth, a contradiction poignantly highlighted by Jacobs. To rationalize the exploitation of dark-skinned slaves' intimate lives, the narrative wove a tale of white women's purity and their perceived supremacy over their black counterparts, often seen as synonymous with licentious behavior. Women from the upper echelons of society claimed the privilege to satiate their desires in unconventional ways, underlining their belief in their superiority over black women. Their actions, in part, served as an outlet for the frustrations that societal norms and the frequent absence of their husbands had instilled. Unable to satisfy their desires within the confines of societal norms, they sought solace in the arms of slaves, a decision that often carried a heavy burden of humiliation. It was not unheard of for housewives to go to extraordinary lengths to conceal pregnancies arising from these relationships, leaving an indelible mark on this tumultuous chapter of history. Untangling the secrets of forbidden love and mixed-race legacies. In the annals of history, there lies a fascinating and often heartbreaking tale of mistresses who sought refuge in the arms of slaves, driven by their own powerlessness in marriages with their husbands. These clandestine affairs occasionally wove a web of intrigue that threatened to unravel into public scandals, attracting the scorn and humiliation of society. From such hidden relationships, a unique consequence emerged, a generation of mixed-race children. The poignant story of Charles Paul's autobiography illustrates this remarkable journey, born of love between a slave and the daughter of a wealthy planter. The girl was confined to her father's residence until she gave birth, but she was denied the privilege of nurturing her own child. Her social standing took a dramatic fall, and her offspring, to sidestep scandal, was consigned to a life of slavery. Tragically, in some cases, even more sinister fates befell these mixed-race children, leading them into the shackles of servitude. Planters' wives, held to a lofty standard of virtue and devotion to their husbands, struggled with their own frustrations. These emotions found a vent in the treatment of the enslaved, seen as a form of property under their control, just like their husbands viewed them. In a disheartening cycle, these women, too, became objects of exploitation, offering them a glimmer of understanding for their own justifiable frustrations. Their personal freedoms were curtailed, and when they embarked on journeys, they did so under the vigilant gaze of male escorts. This intricate chapter of history reveals both the complexity of human relationships and the heavy burdens placed upon those who lived through it. Southern Country Slave Codes Southern country slave codes as low country slave codes demonstrate female mastery were specifically inscribed into the colonies, legislature from their earliest days. South Carolina law stated that slaves castrated for fleeing their master mistress or owner would be further mutilated for repeat escapes, while another from 1740 warned owners failing to provide slaves under his or her charge sufficient clothing covering all food they would be held legally responsible. Georgia's laws held a shadow of impending consequence over those who dared to challenge the status quo of slavery. Masters, mistresses, and overseers found their authority under scrutiny if they hired a slave without the required approval. However, these laws did more than dictate rules, they etched out a map of civic obligations for slaveholders, from bolstering the militia to enlisting slaves in public projects. 
But what makes this tale truly captivating is that these laws used language that didn't discriminate by gender. They acknowledged female slave owners, a fact often overlooked. In the colonial era, women stepped into the role of slave ownership, often thrust into it due to the untimely deaths of male household heads. This ushered in an era of unprecedented financial independence for these women. With newfound autonomy, these women became the leaders of their own destiny. They managed vast plantations, conducting the buying, selling, bequeathing, and hiring of slaves independently. This financial clout, in turn, elevated their status and allowed them to become influential figures within their communities. In a society that was generally unwelcoming to female autonomy, these single women, who owned slaves, guarded their newfound privilege by adhering to the same racial hierarchies that underpinned southern slavery. Their influence extended to both unmarried and married women. Some women entered into marriage with slaves presented to them as gifts from their parents. Legally, these individuals and property, including slaves, were considered the property of their husbands. But in practice, the reality was more complex. Mistresses often made a clear distinction between their own slaves and those owned by their husbands. Some vehemently opposed their husbands' efforts to manage, discipline, or sell their enslaved property. Women who had grown up commanding slaves had internalized their role as slaveholders, complete with their own rights and responsibilities, and they asserted this independence within their marriages. These women were far from passive observers in the slave market. Some, like the formidable Mrs. Arnipour, exhibited business acumen, selling highly skilled slaves for substantial prices, having personally honed their abilities, whether in cooking or carpentry. They were savvy entrepreneurs, navigating the intricate web of slave prices and exploiting market fluctuations. In contrast to popular belief, they either attended auctions themselves or appointed male representatives to act on their behalf. In summary, both single and married women who owned slaves transcended the repressive patriarchal confines of their time, amassing economic power and personal agency. They viewed enslaved individuals not merely as property but as keys to their own destinies. This is a tale of unexpected empowerment in an era fraught with challenges. Unveiling the complex realities of female slavery in the South Within the harsh and unforgiving world of the southern plantations, the lives of female slaves were etched with tales of profound adversity. Despite their immense struggles, these women did not find solace or support from the mistresses who held dominion over their lives. Interestingly, rather than forging a sense of sisterhood with their enslaved counterparts upon witnessing the sexual abuse they endured, the mistresses' reactions were quite the opposite. These women found themselves trapped in a web of powerlessness, unable to curb the transgressions of men. Compounded by the weight of society's hypocritical expectations of female purity, most mistresses chose to avert their gaze, becoming complicit in further victimizing those already oppressed. Take, for instance, the case of Mary Boykin Chestnut, a diarist and slave mistress who could acknowledge the injustices and inequalities of slavery while, paradoxically, likening female slaves to prostitutes. In lieu of extending sympathy to the enslaved women, many mistresses perpetuate harmful stereotypes about black women, branding them as animalistic, hypersexual, and complicit in their own abuse. In one striking incident, Boykin Chestnut recounted a moment where she felt faintly seasick when witnessing the sale of a mulatto woman for sexual purposes. Yet, in her description, the woman was lasciviously ogling the bidders with an excited grin. On smaller plantations, where mistresses were frequently confronted with evidence of their husband's infidelity, their anger often manifested in further mistreatment of the victims. In a feigned autobiographical narrative, Solomon Norfolk recalled the torment of an enslaved woman named Patsy Bean, subjected to brutal punishment due to her mistress's jealousy. The mistress would manipulate her husband and other slaves to whip Patsy out of spite, even attempting to bribe others to end her life. Some may attempt to rationalize such emotionally charged violence as less severe than the systematic abuse attributed to the masters. However, this unpredictable and erratic nature likely sowed fear and trauma among the enslaved individuals. Regrettably, 
the reactions of most mistresses to sexual abuse ultimately perpetuated the broader culture of racialized violence inherent in Southern slavery. Ironically, certain mistresses themselves participated in the exploitation of enslaved bodies in various ways. Emily West and Rosie J. A Night shed light on how these women manipulated and commodified enslaved wet nurses, using them to serve their own needs. The motivations behind employing wet nurses spanned from concerns about their own health to vanity, as they feared that breastfeeding might adversely affect their appearance. Within this world of inequality and cruelty, the lives of female slaves were a tapestry of suffering. This suffering, however, was not only propagated by the masters, but also by the mistresses who, in their own right, wielded a distinct form of power. In the unforgiving world of the southern plantations, where life was marked by cruelty and inequality, a deeper examination reveals a striking tapestry of power dynamics that extended beyond the masters. It was a world where empathy and understanding for the struggles of enslaved individuals were often overshadowed by the overwhelming power wielded by the mistresses. While many expressed personal concerns about the intricacies of nursing their own children, few dared to contemplate the emotional and physical toll exacted from forcing an enslaved mother to set aside her own child for the benefit of another. This wasn't a matter of mere oversight, mistresses actively interfered in the parenting of enslaved women, presiding over pregnancies, doling out home remedies, designating certain slaves as midwives, and sometimes even deciding the location of childbirth. Though their intentions might have been well-meant, these interventions beg the question of how these intrusions impacted the emotional and physical well-being of the enslaved mothers. It's also crucial to recognize that their interest in slave reproduction wasn't entirely altruistic. A healthy child was a valuable commodity, one that could later be ripped from their families and sold for profit. Despite certain shared experiences of womanhood, the mistresses did not emerge as allies against the prevailing societal norms. Instead, these situations served as stages upon which they reinforced the existing racial hierarchies, safeguarding their own privilege and influence. What's particularly intriguing is that it wasn't only the white men who engaged in the sexual exploitation of enslaved individuals. Some white women were also involved. The circumstances fostering such abuse, including the availability of enslaved bodies and the manipulation of sex as a tool to perpetuate racial hierarchies and power dynamics, led to similar interactions between mistresses and enslaved men. For instance, Harriet Jacobs recounted instances where mistresses observed and learned from the authority wielded by their fathers over female slaves. Some of these women, in their quest to exert control, strategically selected the most brutalized male slaves as partners, ensuring they could maintain absolute dominance without the risk of exposure. Intriguingly, it's important to note that sexualized abuse didn't always involve rape. The daily encounters in the South often carried a disturbingly sexual undertone, influenced by the skunk clothing worn by some enslaved individuals. The public display of black male bodies in front of upper-class white women unnerved northern observers. It wasn't uncommon to witness enslaved men wearing loose shirts that exposed their thighs while tending to the needs of the ladies, who displayed no apparent discomfort or embarrassment. Moreover, Violations of privacy extended to the mistresses overseeing or directly engaging in the physical abuse of unclothed slaves, paralleling the actions of the masters. This might involve ordering enslaved individuals to provide intimate administrations on their bodies. To secure their silence afterward, some white women employed a sinister tactic, threatening to accuse enslaved men of rape if they dared to reveal any compromising information. This tactic demonstrated a recognition of and manipulation of social stereotypes associating blackness with sexual aggression, much like their male counterparts. These various examples underscore the intricate power dynamics that played out in the lives of white women in the antebellum South. In a society that largely denied them sexual agency, they found a different form of power through domination and violation of the bodies of the enslaved.